Thing. Order! Order! And you are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Obesity now causes more cases of some cancers than smoking. The charity Cancer Research UK says bowel, kidney, ovarian and liver cancers are all more likely to have been caused by being overweight than by smoking tobacco. The number of obese adults in Britain has risen dramatically over the past two decades to around 15 million people, while the number of smokers has fallen sharply to 6 million. Our health correspondent Sophie Hutchinson reports. Is that what you say when you're buying them? Oh, they're not for me. They're not for me. <laughs> a weight loss meeting to talk about unhealthy habits and how to change them. This group tries to tackle the underlying reasons behind obesity. We know that chocolate cake is bad and salads are good, yet why do we still keep going for that chocolate cake? So I am successful in my work, I'm successful in my home, I'm not a stupid person, yet I still keep going for those bad food choices. So it's all up here. And news that so being obese sort of puts people at greater out? risk of four types of cancer than smoking way. does hasn't gone unnoticed. Sometimes it can be normalised that it's, it's OK to be overweight, but the, the news today, I think sh it will make a difference. It certainly made me think differently. The four cancers are kidney, liver, ovarian and bowel. The most common is bowel, with 42,000 new cases a year. Obesity is responsible for nearly 5,000 of them, while smoking causes just below 3,000. So how does obesity cause cancer? Excess fat sends out signals which encourage cells to divide more often. It's thought that's the process that increases the chance of cancerous cells being made. In comparison to smoking, where well over 80% of people will tell you it's a cause of cancer, when we started our campaign, only around 15% of people would mention obesity unprompted. And as we're saying, obesity is actually the biggest cause of cancer after smoking. But the latest attempt to warn of the harm of obesity has come under fire. This billboard is meant to look like a cigarette packet. It says, like smoking, obesity puts millions of adults at greater risk of cancer. But some have described it as fat shaming and say it's stigmatizing and that campaigns like this simply won't work. To combat obesity, the government has cut sugar from half the drinks on sale and is funding more exercise in schools. I should stop eating cereal at 9 o'clock at night. But with the numbers of obese people remaining stubbornly high, campaigners say more support and treatment are desperately needed. Sophie Hutchinson, BBC News. Is the state of a nation measured by the health of its population? And if so, what do a combination of an obesity crisis now posing a greater cancer risk than smoking and a stalling UK life expectancy tell us about the state of Britain? Obese people now outnumber smokers two to one. And today we learnt four common cancers are now more likely to be caused by sufferers being overweight than being smokers. If life expectancy continues to stall, children may no longer be able to expect to live longer than the generation before them. It fits into a pattern of a UK that has stopped making gains in terms of public health. Here's David Grossman. First, the good news. Life expectancy in the UK in the last century has more or less doubled. Every generation of children expecting to live longer than the one before. Millions of extra years of healthy life. Now, the not so good news. In the last few years, those gains have slowed, the lines have plateaued and may even be heading in reverse. The big question, of course, is why. The inflection point when the line flattened corresponded with the austerity of the Cameron Osborne years. According to Professor Danny Dawling, what's happening is obvious when you look at who is now dying earlier. The clue as to what's going on is it's people who are frail, who are in need of care, who are almost certainly not getting the kind of care that they used to get a few years ago. And so you put that down to government action or inaction? It's government action. Um, government have halved the number of visits of adult social workers to elderly people. Now you can imagine that the visits of elderly social workers had no effect whatsoever, but at the same time as the government has halved them and all the kind of help that people used to get, more have died earlier. But not so far, say other experts. Mortality, they say, is hugely complex. Many different variables interacting in ways we can't always understand. The reality is it's probably too early to see 
um, you know, what, imp what impact um, sort of those you know, changes in government policy, for example, um, might have on, on mortality. Um, and that's the sort of thing you would probably only pick up a little bit further down the line. And again, it's whether it, you can actually decouple that from other factors that are affecting um, mortality improvement. But one conclusion that's hard to ignore is that the UK has fallen behind on international comparisons. If we look at the years 2004 to 2010, improvements in the UK look pretty good compared to similar countries. But now look at the years 2010 to 2016. Only the US has done worse than us. The problem though for those who blame austerity is that many of these countries also went through a similar fiscal tightening. The slowdown in improvements is common to many countries in Europe and indeed not just Europe, so many of the better off countries in the world have seen this. But the United Kingdom has probably seen it one of the worst. So although it's a common feature, we do sit quite low at the bottom of the table. And in some areas, particularly life expectancy for women, we didn't start from a good place anyway. One undoubted cause of improvement is huge reductions in the rates of smoking, down a third on levels of the early 70s. Many experts attribute the big decline in deaths from coronary heart disease to this simple fact. But as one cause of ill health declines, others increase in relative terms. Today, the news that obesity now causes more cases of some cancers than smoking. The fact is that staying alive longer from not smoking means that something else can kill you. In the long run, mortality rates are 100%. It's strange that the Health Select Committee haven't decided we need an inquiry. It's strange that none of the four chief medical officers of the UK have actually launched their own inquiry. It's strange that ONS hasn't decided it really ought to try to look at the reasons behind this. But without concrete evidence, policymakers seem uncertain how to address these health challenges. Today, would-be Prime Minister Boris Johnson ruled out levying higher taxes on foods high in salt, sugar or fat until a review is complete. He has a long record of being opposed to so-called sin taxes. But do they work? Sin taxes sometimes hit the least well off and so we need to balance the health impact up against the impact on people's incomes. But there is a lot of evidence behind sin taxes that they can dissuade people. Of course if you put the price up, people use them less. There's nothing inevitable though about flatlining life expectancy. There's still clear room for improvement. For example, in Japan, people live more than three years longer on average than people in the UK. But for politicians, finding ways to help us stay healthy longer is a challenge that's getting bigger, along with our waistlines. Well, we asked the Department for Health if they wanted to talk about this, but they didn't. Earlier, I spoke to Jonathan Ashworth, Labour's Shadow Health Secretary. I began by asking him why he thinks life expectancy is stalling. There's a complex set of reasons, but I'm a, I do think Tory austerity is a big part of it. It's, it's cutbacks. So when you, when you drill into the figures, I think the £7 billion worth of cuts to adult social care has really affected uh, the provision and support that very elderly and vulnerable people no longer get in society. I think that is one of the reasons why life expectancy has gone backwards. But it's also about the quality of housing, the quality of jobs that people have, the air that we breathe. There's a whole range of social determinants of ill health, and we don't have a government tackling them. So what levers do you think can be pulled to try and change this? Well there's a number of things you've got to do. You've got to fully fund your NHS but to improve population health as a whole you've got to fully fund the whole of the, uh, of, of, of the public sphere. So you need to be investing in housing, you need to be investing in early years but we, are, but we also need to be more interventionist in society. I believe, for, for example, you know, we should be expanding the sugar tax. I think it's been a success. I believe we should have mandatory labelling on bottles of drink and bottles of lager and bottles, uh, 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 bottles, of, bottles of wine. I think we need a Clean Air Act. We've got one of the highest death rates for young people from asthma in Europe. You mentioned the sugar tax. We, you know, we know that half of the drinks have much less sugar in them as a result. It's you know, taken out 45 million kilograms yeah. of sugar per year, but is there evidence that it's actually having an impact on obesity, for example? Well, I think it's, a tremendous, it's been a tremendous success that, that 45 million kilograms of sugar has been taken away. I mean, that's, that is great. But and can we sugar... say that that is 
making any difference to well, childhood obesity rates, for well, example. Well, some of the, we will not see the impact of some of these uh, decisions for, year, for years and years because you have to look across a, a, cohort, over a, number of, a, a cohort of children as they grow up over, an, over a number of years. But I think, it is, I think it is making a difference. But it's not the only lever you pull. I mean, I would, I would for example, ban the advertising of junk food on family TV. I mean, I've got young children. I watch The X Factor with them and Britain's Got Talent. And, the, and when the adverts come on, it's constant junk food and my children are hassling me to go to you know take them to mcdonald's the next day and so there's huge pressure on parents what else then do you think there should be a tax on chocolate bars no i'm not i don't think we need to be taxing chocolate bars and food but i think fizzy drinks and and which is the right things for the government to have done and milkshakes is the correct thing to do because it's forced the manufacturers the food producers to reformulate and that can only be a good thing but if you tax biscuits if you tax cakes perhaps you'd have the same yeah, but I think, I mean, food items is slightly different, I think, because we've had a long principle in this country of not taxing food, so we're not proposing that. And when you read, when you hear about the arguments going on in the Conservative Party at the moment over sugar tax, for example, what do you think? Boris Johnson isn't. I mean, when he was the Mayor of London, he was in favour of a sugar tax. He's got all these, um, you know, tobacco companies and drinks companies and so on back in his campaign. It looks like he's just sort of given in to corporate, corporate lobbyists rather than doing what is right for the children of this country. When you've got life expectancy going backwards, when you've got infant mortality rates getting worse, when you've got health inequalities getting wider and wider, we should be intervening more to improve people's health and well-being. And even if Boris Johnson wants to say, well, that's a sort of nanny state approach, you know, think about it from the taxpayer's point of view. By not intervening early, you just increase pressures long term on the NHS and ultimately the taxpayer picks up the bill. Well, I'm joined by Sir Michael Marmot, former president of the World Medical Association and director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. And Sir Michael, when it comes to life expectancy, I mean, what's gone wrong in the UK? Well, the first thing to say is that the health of a population tells us a great deal about the society. And if life expectancy, and particularly healthy life expectancy, has stopped increasing, it means something's wrong with society. What's wrong? Well, one of the dramatic findings now is that health inequalities are increasing, which means inequalities in the conditions that lead to health are increasing. Initially, as you could see from your report, the rise in mortality was at older ages, and arguably that could have been due to the cuts in social care funding and the failure of the NHS expenditure to rise with inflation. But now what we're seeing is mortality at younger ages is rising, and particularly the problem in the US of stalling life expectancy has in large measure been attributed to what they call deaths of despair drug poisonings, alcohol poisonings, suicide, and chronic liver disease due to alcohol. And we're starting to see those deaths of despair in the UK. And do we have the data to tell us why it's happening? I mean, for example, John Ashworth, Jonathan Ashworth, he was talking about austerity, it being complex, but austerity playing a big role. You know, other people on life expectancy say, well, look, at some point you've got a plateau because, you know, we've doubled life expectancy in the last century. At some point, you've got to reach a point. Do we have the data or are we still on guesstimates? We have to be on guesstimates because we've got this one-off phenomenon and you can't do a controlled experiment, obviously. So we've got to speculate. And I've been quite careful in saying, I cannot say that it was austerity because other things might have happened. What we do know, though, is that the inequalities in life expectancy were getting smaller from around 2002 to about 2012. And the stalling of life expectancy started around that time, 2011-12, at the time that the inequalities were increasing. So we have to ask the question, what happened in 2010? And we know Could that it, that was when austerity began. That's when austerity began. And how so we have to ask that question. And then we see with, as John Ashworth said, the increase in inequality in infant mortality. Well, we know that there's now an increase in child poverty, partly related to the cost of housing, but also to changes in the tax and benefit system. 
We know that Sure Start Children's Centres, about a thousand of them, have closed. We know that their difficulties with making ends meet on welfare now. We know that people's nutrition is inadequate because so many people are having to resort to food banks. So a lot of things have changed through the life course. And what about childhood obesity? I mean, clearly, obesity is a huge public health crisis. I wondered how that played into life expectancy. And also, you know, when you hear the front runner in the Tory leadership uh, race talk about these sin taxes and suggesting that, you know, he's not sure that they're valuable and that they penalise the poor, what do you think? Well, the first thing is that I think it's probably not the case that obesity led to the stalling of the life expectancy. I'm not giving obesity a clean bill of health by any means. I think we're storing up problems for the future. Now, let's look at childhood obesity. What we've seen is that the rise of obesity in children from better off families has stopped. It was going up, but it's not anymore. But obesity is still rising in children from more disadvantaged families. So the so inequalities... So do you think what Boris Johnson said today is reckless? Do you think that's reckless? Well, I don't think taxing sugar by itself is going to solve the inequalities in obesity. Has it On... had an impact, do you think? It appears to have had an impact. On uh, obesity? Well, it appears to have had an impact on sugar consumption. We know in Mexico, where they did it first, it seems to have had a beneficial impact. It seems to be having a beneficial impact where it's been tried. So it's certainly one of the things you would want to do. But I've said, probably somewhat melodramatically, if you want to solve the childhood obesity problem, you have to solve the inequality problem because we see that the rise of childhood obesity is happening to a much greater extent in children from disadvantaged families. So, Michael Marmot, thank you very much for coming in. Very enlightening.